I believe that God's people should be the happiest people. We have something to be happy about. We have something to have joy. The world may have happiness, but we as God's people have joy. And the joy of the Lord is our... Amen. That was good. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Okay? You know that verse? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. I ought to teach you the song too. And uh, there's a song that goes with that verse. And uh, praise the Lord. Good to be here with you this morning. And uh, what a joy to talk about camp. We spent the uh, Sunday school hour giving you a verse that's very, very important. Uh, Psalm 102, 18 talks about the uh, great uh, task we have to pass to the next generation the truth of God's word. Uh, we have a little problem today in America, and that's because we haven't been transferring the truth of God's word. Uh, literally about 70 years ago, well, I should say 60, 60 years ago, we threw God and the Bible and the Ten Commandments out of the school system. And uh, we're reaping the results of that today, aren't we? And uh, when you abandon God, he abandons you. And uh, we, we, we get all in trouble and then we cry out, God, help us, help us, help us. And he said, well, you, you turned your back on me a long time ago. Why should I help you? Of course, we have a merciful God, don't we, huh? A loving God, a caring God, a, a God who is holy and yet loving, a God who is perfect and a great judge, but yet a great God of mercy. Praise God for that. If you're saved this morning, you ought to be shouting. You ought to be saying, thank the Lord I'm saved. Amen? Amen. And uh, it's good to be saved. If you're saved, if you're not saved, you need to get saved. And the world mocks at that, don't they? They go, oh, he got saved. He got saved. They laugh. They laugh. But that is a Bible word. Did you know that? Yeah. Amen. That's why we use it. And uh, we need to pray for one another. Folks, get saved. And uh, it's good to be here with you this morning. Uh, let me just wrap up the uh, camp. We give quite a bit of information during the Sunday school hour. But at the door, when you see me th this morning, I'll be at the door. That door right there, door number one. That's door number two. That's door number three. That's door number four. Okay? And uh, so there is a new Cadillac for everyone behind door number five. But I don't know where door number five is. Okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, man, brother, he's from Wyoming. He has the Cadillac. Okay. And uh, so in your uh, exiting this morning, I have a brochure on this campaign that Pastor has been talking about. It's called the Uplook Campaign. It started out very humbly. Three years ago, I said to our camp director, Pastor Wittes, I said, brother, we need, to, we need to upgrade camp. Let's raise some money. I said, people want to give. We, we just need to give them a vehicle to give to. And so I, he said, well, what would you call it? I said, and I got to thinking about that big old mountain up there. And I thought about the verse that's on the sign as you go out the door at camp. It says, lift up your eyes unto the hills from whence cometh your help. And uh, as I thought about that, I thought, lift up, 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 up. I said, let's keep looking up, right? The up look. And so we came up with that name, the Uplook Campaign. And we're seeking to remodel camp to make it better. We will never remodel the Bible. It's Amen. still the old-fashioned Word of God. We're not going to change that. Amen? We're not going to change the emphasis of camp on spiritual emphasis. That's not why we go as far as play. Play is part of it, but Bible, spiritual, is number one. Okay, and so uh, we're not changing that. We're not remodeling that. That's what's been going on in our world today. Remodeling God. He doesn't need any remodeling. We need to get back to the old fashioned word of God. And so we're going to remodel camp, though, to make it a little bit easier for us to exist up there for a week. We don't have cell phone service up there. You say, oh, that's terrible. No, that's good. That's good. You get the kids away from the cell phone. Get them away from all these other things that, that are not really edifying and get them into the Word of God and around God's people. And uh, so we, we're believing God for revival at camp. But the refurbishing is called the Uplook, and we'd like to ask you to give to it. Uh, we thought, well, well, we'll, we'll get some new tables and chairs. We'll... Uh, 
we'll fix up the dining hall, we'll fix up the main lodge, we'll paint it. We, someday we're going to paint all the cabins. You know, we thought, well, if we raise 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars, well, that, that'd be great. You know what has happened? In three years, we've raised over a hundred thousand dollars. Isn't that exciting? And churches just like Faith Baptist here are giving. Churches that are not large, by the way, you have a great, great church here, a great crowd. But uh, churches that are not, you say, well, let the big churches. We don't have any big churches in our fellowship. And uh, praise God, we have some good, solid churches that are seeking to win souls and love people for Jesus Christ. But, you know, we don't have any mega churches, praise God. And, uh, but we have churches that are really standing for God. And that's where that $100,000 has come from. And so now we're trying to go to phase three. Phase one was the main lodge. We never dreamed beyond that. Then phase two was the open air pavilion. The roof is on. All the rough is on, isn't that exciting? And it's ready to be used. And then phase three, that's the one we're starting on now, is called the skunk. And that's our bathhouse. And we're going to tear it down. In fact, we did tear it down. It's gone. And uh, we want to rebuild in its place a brand new bathhouse. Men and women's sides, beautiful place. Uh, take showers and use the restroom and... Uh, be a modern facility. Now, I have those Uplook brochures available, and then I have the brand new Vista. Every month or two, we send the Vista to Pastor. He puts it on the table back there. This is the first Vista that we've ever had pictures in it, and we put Pastor's picture right on the front. And uh, so you'll want to get one of these and pray for your pastor. You can put that right on your refrigerator. Pray for your pastor and all of us other pastors this is a pastor-led fellowship and uh, the Intermountain Baptist Fellowship and pray for us here are the uh, current board members. And then on the back, we show phase one, phase two, and phase three of the Castle Rock Baptist Camp Uplook campaign. And so we're in, gonna challenge you to give to that today. Uh, I pastored for 30 years. I planted a church in downtown Milwaukee. It was called Souls Harbor. It's a beacon, a lighthouse today of God's grace in a very dark place. And I stayed for 30 years, planted it. I was a young man, Mrs. Hoover has always been young and still is young, and I've just been the one that is aged. But uh, I stayed 30 years. Wow, Amen. but that's by the grace of God. But I have never felt bad about asking God's people to give of their time, their talents, and their treasure. Back there in Milwaukee, there is a church full of people who started out lost as lost can be without Jesus. Many of them in jail, coming out of jail, uh, drug addicts, drug pushers, prostitutes. God richly blessed. And today, trophies of God's grace. And they learned how to walk with God and to give of time, talents, and treasure. I never felt bad because it only just blessed them. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes you think poor people don't want to give. I'm telling you that some of the most generous people on this planet are right there in the hearts of our big cities. Poor people. I would knock on door. I treated the church in the early days like the bus route. And so I'd visit everybody in church every Saturday. And I'd knock on their door. Coming to church tomorrow? Oh, yes, Pastor, we'll be there. See you tomorrow. Oh, yeah, we'll be there. Oh, Pastor, I can't come tomorrow. Why? Because I don't have an offering to give. What? We want you to come to church whether you have an offering to give or not. Amen? We want you to be there. You will be a blessing to us just by being there. And you can't get encouraged and challenged and fed if you're not there. Amen? And so... Wasn't that amazing, though? The hearts of some of those people always wanting to give, wanting to give of themselves, and they didn't have a lot. It was like the widow's might. It was like the widow's might. And what a blessing they were to us to see their sincerity, their love to give. In this crowd right here, there are some that can't, but there's a lot of folks that can. And if God lays it on your heart, give to the Uplook campaign. I'd rather you give to that than to give to a love offering for Cindy and me. We appreciate that. We need it. But 
I'd rather us get that Uplook campaign finished and to get these buildings built and to see the hundreds and thousands of Jesus tarries of boys and girls, teenagers and adults get help spiritually. There have been many, many people on that property, 14 acres, right under the big sky in the Gallatin Gateway that have been saved right there. Boy, I tell you what, that old chapel, Runquist Chapel, that is classic log chapel, wood floors. It was like Sheffy. Have you ever seen the great preacher Sheffy, the film Sheffy? It's like one of those old camp meeting uh, preaching centers. What, what a blessing. And then all the other things that God has blessed us with there. And so, hey, we're rich today, aren't we? Amen. We're rich. Just by being saved, you are the richest person on the planet. Amen? Let's give to a God who loves us and wants to be close to us. God is a warm God. Don't keep pushing him off and don't be cold towards him. Be warm towards him. Love him. All right? So, Pastor, did I cover everything? that you? I, I, tell me if I missed something because I, I got so much to remember. And so uh, see me at the door, get the brochures, give. Uh, and if you don't have it today, I'm sure Pastor would accept the offerings later. But uh, give today if you can. And uh, let's believe God for great and mighty things. Okay? Hey, we just have a few minutes left. Take your Bibles this morning and let's look into the Word of God. Back to the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 11. A different psalm than where we were in Sunday school. Psalm 11 and verse 3. You know this verse has always challenged me. Psalm 11, 3. This verse has always challenged me. I've been always intrigued by this verse. Psalm 11, 3. What a great verse. But now that we're in the situation we are in today, where in the streets of our cities, we have people that are looting, destroying, tearing down. We have a society that we wake up and we say, are we still in America? Have you ever thought that recently? Is this America? What happened to America? It's like we all went somewhere and came back. And yeah, I, I was working the other day with a fellow that's newly uh, out of jail. He's uh, probably not saved. We've witnessed to him. He professes to be saved, but we're, we're trying to see him truly, genuinely get saved if he's not, and uh, working with him. And he was in prison for 20 years. Can you imagine coming out into this world after being locked up for 20 years? A lot has changed in America in 20 years. A lot has changed in the last 20 days. Amen? And as we think of what's going on in our society today, this verse intrigues me. Psalm 11. Verse 3, I believe it has a question here, but I believe there's a Bible answer. Psalm 11 and verse number 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Well, can the righteous do anything? Sometimes we may just look at that verse and say, well, what's the use? Can't do anything about it. I'm telling you, if you know Jesus as your Savior, there is an answer. God is never surprised by anything. God is on the job. God is fully aware. God is working in the midst of all this. By the way, God is working, work through COVID. I know you think, well, that was a loss bunch of months. Man, the first half of this year is kind of a lost cause. But you know what? Don't think that way. God used COVID and still will use the virus in a powerful way around the world. We have had more of the gospel get into the airways than we ever had before through live streaming. Now, I'm not glorifying live streaming. I'm not glorifying that we had to stay home from church. Not at all. But I am saying God has his ways today. He is working his plan. It's ever so slowly like the potter's wheel. But as we stay as clay on the potter's wheel, God is able to do great and mighty things. When we jump off, when we do our own thing, when we're stubborn, when we're indifferent, when we're cold, God can't do anything. But when we say, yes, Lord, I surrender all, when we yield to his work in our life, God can do great and mighty things. Oh, how he wants to today. Oh, how he's sad when he sees Christians that are cold and indifferent and not surrendered. Oh, when we're right with God, when we're surrendered, when we say, yes, Lord, I surrender all. Lord, I want to be used. You know, sometimes we're, we're like the people in the inner city. I'd say, now you need to get a job. You just got saved. You've been, you haven't worked and you, you don't have a job. You, you need to get saved. Uh, excuse me, you need to get a job. 
After you get saved, you start living for God. Let's get into our Bible. Let's start growing in grace. And then let's take care of our family. It's the Bible. And uh, they'd say, well, I haven't been able to find a job that's worthy of my labor. I expect to start at $20 an hour. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? You need to take a job and do a good job. And when you do a good job, there's a better job out there. But you're not getting that one until you start having a job. Woo! They'd maybe get a little mad at the preacher and they'd walk off. They'd come back. Okay, preacher, could you help me find a job? Yes. Every week of the year. People calling and saying, I need workers. But I need them to show up on time. And I need them to do a good job. And guess what? If those folks would follow through, God would bless in a wonderful way in their lives. We saw God bless and trophies of grace. People were getting better jobs, better housing, further away from the church. Don't forget us down here in the inner city. Don't forget us. You know, this is where you came from. Well, Pastor, you know, we're, we're doing so well. We're going to go out to church in the suburbs now. Well, don't forget us down here. But you know what? As God works in our life, as we start somewhere, God will do something great in our life. And he's looking for Christians who will say, I will surrender. I'll do the little things, the things that people don't really uh, get excited about. I'll do that for you, Lord. You know, you say, well, I won't serve God unless I'm in the limelight. I won't serve God unless I get my name in the paper. I won't serve God unless my name is on the marquee. God is looking for people who are nameless, who will just say, I'll be a servant for God. That's what he's looking for. If the foundations be broken, what can the righteous do? What can the righteous do? Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'll bless now this message this morning. Use it in a great way in our hearts and lives. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to see several things about this verse. It's a question. Did you notice that? And we start in verse number 1 of chapter 11 of Psalms in the Lord. Put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountains, for lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try, and the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempests. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. Folks, he loves the upright. You may be saying today, I'm living for God. I'm seeking to live a, a godly life and raise a godly family. I'm trying to do right. And, and it just seems like everything that I'm doing is being destroyed all around me. No, God is very slow many times to his wrath. He is being very patient upon the wicked today. He's letting them, he's letting Satan have a little time. But I'm telling you, God will always take care of you. In the end, you and I that know Jesus Christ and trying to do that which is right, godly, glorifying God, our day is, is coming. So don't get weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we think not. But what can we do today? God gives us some answers on what we can do in the midst of all this. Instead of throwing up our hands, God says, there is hope. There is hope. God says, I've already done something. Take your Bibles, hold it. If you've got a Bible marker, put it in Psalm 11. We might be back. But let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. Here's, here's an answer. This is God's plan. Isaiah 59, 19. This is God's plan. He's not unaware. He's fully aware. Isaiah 59. 19 and 20. Isaiah 59. What does God do when the enemy comes in like a flood? So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Notice verse 19. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard. You know, that standard there is, is a, it, it, like a flag. That's what that word standard means. It's like a flag. Praise God for the American flag. 
You know, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And I love that part where it says what? One nation under God. We've taken that part out. Under God, those two words. You say, well, what's the big deal? It's just two words. My friends, it's not two words only. It's talking about the great God, creator of this universe. We have politicians today that can't even say those words. Creator. Because it would then uh, profess that there is a creator. We find the Bible says that they'll, they'll try to get rid of God. They'll get rid of God in their words. They'll try to get rid of God in society. And they've done a pretty good job at it. But praise God, we are not to be the silent minority sitting in these uh, soft chairs here at Faith Baptist Church this morning. We're to be speaking up for Jesus Christ. This is not just a Montana crowd. This is a Montana, Wyoming crowd. Praise God for you in these two states. You say, well, we, we live in this very wonderful utopia out here in the West, and everybody is God-fearing, and, and, and you know, we have it so good. My friends, that can quickly change. That can quickly change, and we're not supposed to just sit here on our laurels and be warmed and filled here in this uh, soft uh, area. I, I, I was in the hotbed of, of wickedness there in the inner city. You stand up and talk Bible truth and stand for righteousness and, and be a godly conservative Christian. The, you don't uh, get any awards for that. You get scorned, you get laughed at, you get, uh, they try to shout you down. Boy, I tell you what, what, Cindy and I moved here almost three years ago. I've been enjoying freedom of speech. Amen. I had it back there, but you know what? You have a, you, there's an intimidation factor. But we, we need to be gracious, loving. You know, we're not to be obnoxious. But we need to stand up and speak. And so I started speaking up in the inner city. And, you know, neighbors would say, well, hey, preacher, Ever since your church has been here, my house hasn't been broken into. Well, amen. Why is that? Why is that? Because I don't believe in no snitch. If I see somebody breaking into somebody's house, I'm calling the police. Yeah, it changed the neighborhood. Yeah, it, it got on notice. Down a block away at 14th and Juno, notorious neighborhood at the edge of Martin Luther King Park. There was a corner store there that sold these, and I'm, forgive me, I've never tasted alcohol, but I think they're called a, they're a big bottle of beer. They're, they're, they're you know, 40, I don't know. I, they have a name for them. But anyway, some of you may know. But uh, as they do big old things, and they'd go in there, and they'd scrape together their money and buy that and go across and sit under the pavilion in the park and drink their day away. And uh, the man who owned the store, he was... Uh, Indian, from India. His name was Singh. He was of the, Singh, uh, of the Sikh sect. And he had a big turban. And he'd come and see us. Oh, Pastor, he'd come to my services a block away. Oh, Pastor, you be good to me, I'll be good to you. I said, Singh, I'm all for you. I want you to know Jesus as your Savior. But I said, your, your store is a cause of tremendous crime in our neighborhood. I mean, these people, their lives are wasted. Plus, there's all this drug activity right out on, in broad daylight on your... In fact, the police are afraid to come to your corner. They told me, don't send me to 14th and Juno. I said, we've got to do something about it. We're going to get your liquor license pulled by the city of Milwaukee. And we did. He said, oh, I'm going to lose my business. And I said, I'm sorry. But your business is not edifying to our neighborhood. And what you're doing is not going to help us. It's going to hurt us. And lives are going to be destroyed because of your business. And so things changed. It got real quiet on that corner. And uh, so on. I I've been there, folks. I've been there where <clears throat> when we bought that big old church downtown uh, building there, uh, we walked up and for all over a block were syringes on the ground from drugs. We started cleaning things up. We've cleaned things up physically. But more important, we sought to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you can put a coat and a nice coat on a drunk. But what they really need is Jesus inside. Amen. They need to know Christ. You can teach a man how to fish. But you know what? What he really needs is to know Jesus Christ as his Savior. He needs a transformed life. 
If the foundations be broken, what can the righteous do? What are the foundations? Well, we have the foundation of the home. In America, it is destroyed today. We have the foundation of the Bible preaching church. Today, in some ways, we're scorned. We're scoffed at because we stand upon the word of God. We're scoffed at by singing those hymns. There are people who will say, I won't go to your church because all you do is sing hymns. I want some kind of contemporary jive. What they need is the old fashioned doctrinally straight hymns. They need the old time music that glorifies God instead of edifying the flesh. But I'm telling you what, this music, I rest my case at the cross. It speaks to my soul. It feeds and challenges my soul. I walk out of this building saying, I can face a week ahead because I rest my case at the cross. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing the glories and grace of our great God and King. Oh, my friends today, may we realize the importance of the old time church, the old time religion, and realize it's a foundation. And then we have the foundation today of our government. What once was a God-fearing government is seeking to let God and push God out today. We need a government of the people, by the people, God-ordained, God-honoring, God-fearing. Oh, how we've gotten away from that, and no wonder we're in the mess we're in today. Oh, my friends, today the foundations are destroyed. What can the righteous do? It's time for people just like you and I here in this place this morning to stand up and stand up strong for Jesus Christ. When we, if Jesus tarries another day and we face a work week ahead, may we go to that job saying, hey, this is what I'm doing to, to uh, make a living, but I'm seeking to make an impact for Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of my getting out of the house today, to live for Christ. And in my home, I'm trying to raise up a godly heritage. You say, it's just my wife and I. Well, amen. Praise God for your wife and you standing up for Jesus. Well, you say, it's just me. I'm a single woman or I'm a single man. Praise God, you're a family. And may you stand up for Jesus. May your neighbors know that you love Jesus and, they lo and that you love them. Be kind to them. You say, you don't know what my neighbor did to me. I know what I did to Jesus. It was my sins that nailed him to the cross. But he didn't hold it against me, did he? He reached way down. And he pulled me out of the old miry clay and set my feet on a rock. Amen? The least I can do is love my neighbor. He said, oh, they're just a bunch of old drunks. I guarantee you that's where I'd be if I hadn't gotten saved. I was raised in a preacher's home, praise God. I've never tasted a cigarette or an ounce of alcohol. I don't know anything about that. God has been so good, but that didn't save me. As a five-year-old boy, under the preaching of an old-time evangelist named Monroe Parker, I asked Jesus to be my Savior. Thank God. If you're saved, you have a similar story. Oh, what a great thing to be saved this morning and to know it. If the foundations be broken, what can the righteous do? pastor asked me to preach on or to share about church planting and I haven't done that this morning but one of the things I have here is that, and I I've left out most of the message but I will get you out on time today let me close with this God shows us what can the righteous do first of all we need a surrendered life a surrendered life a life that says I surrender all, Lord Jesus, my hands, my feet, my tongue, my mouth, my being. I surrender it to you. Secondly, we need to raise up a godly walk with the Lord. Raise up a godly walk. If the foundations be broken, what can the righteous do? Raise up a godly walk. Raise up a godly family. Raise up a godly family. Invest in the future in things like the Uplook campaign. And, and of course, tithe and honor God with the tithe and above and beyond the tithe. If you have faith, promise, giving for missions, praise God, give and honor and invest in that which is going to be eternal. And then leave a godly legacy. Local church reproduction. A few weeks ago, I preached this message, May 31st, Camp Sunday at First Baptist Church of Laurel, Montana. And I'm a member there. Cindy and I are members. And uh, we live near Laurel. And... Uh, 
It wasn't in my notes, but it's in my heart. Here I am, part of that church. They have never, ever planted a brand new church physically out of their church. They have missions, wonderful missions program. Missionaries around the world who are planting churches, praise God. I'm sure they would stand before the Lord and be just fine, but I challenged them with this. I said, folks, it's time for First Baptist Church to plant a church. I don't know where. It could be in another state. And I don't know who the church planner is. But it's time to start praying and giving towards that. It's time for First Baptist Church to have a baby. They all, boy, I got their attention. They all look, it's time. I started off this way. It's time to have a baby. (laughs) Martha, what did he say? I don't know, George. He said, it's time to have a baby. It's time to have a spiritual baby to plant, reproduce ourselves somewhere else. It revolutionizes a church. A church like Faith Baptist Church can be part of reproduction. It could be somewhere on Timbuktu, I don't know. And you may not be the only one reproducing, but a part of two churches, three churches, four churches that get together. We are on church plant with Reaching America, and I haven't even talked to you about it today. 56. The first one, Chicago, Illinois. The second one, Los Angeles, California. The third one, Brooklyn, New York. Let me tell you about Brooklyn, New York. That church, four different pastors and their churches in Queens, Long Island, and Brooklyn got together and they planted a brand new church in Bensonhurst. It's a very rough area. They planted the Bensonhurst Baptist Church. Every week they would send a different a group, a different church would be in charge of the special music in charge of sending a, a preacher for that Sunday. They rented a storefront. To this day, there is a great thriving inner city church there. It's exciting. 23 years ago, we started Inner City Baptist Missions, which now is called Reaching America Baptist Partners. 56 churches later. Isn't that exciting? It's time to have a baby. Amen. I know it's kind of disjointed to go from my message to that. And I loved talking about church planning, but I believe that we need all that today. Just want to leave you with that little seed thought. Maybe pastor will have me come back and I'll just forget about camp. Just focus on church planning. I'd love to tell you all about it. But I've told you a little bit. Would you start just praying? Lord, bless the church plants across America and around the world. Help our missionaries. Here's a prayer I'd like to ask you to pray for. Help our missionaries to plant churches. Why are they there? Well, to win souls. Well, that's part of it. Amen? If you win souls, you've got to have a place to go to church. Amen? Help our missionaries plant churches. We've got specialists on these fields. Uh, Bible institutes and Bible colleges and and deaf ministries and all kinds of things. I praise God for that. But we need to get back. You may not agree with this, but we need to get back to old-fashioned church planting around the world. You say, well, not in America. Good night. We've got churches everywhere. I'm talking about churches that preach the word. Old-fashioned, Bible-believing churches that stand upon the Word of God and are unashamed about knocking on doors and talking to people about Jesus. Heads are bowed, please. Eyes are closed. Father, we thank you now for these folks who've been so attentive this morning. Now, bless. In these moments, as we close, as we think of this invitation, Lord, that's so important for us as Christians to always be ready to make a godly decision at the altar, a godly decision even there by our chair. A godly decision every single day. Help us to make a decision for living for Christ. To have a renewed interest. A renewed walk with God. Speak to us today. Lord, work in hearts. Lord, there might be somebody right in this room that's never been saved. Never been saved. They maybe are a church member. They maybe have taken communion. They maybe have been baptized. But they've never been saved. And Lord, none of that helps Only salvation through Jesus Christ, simple faith, turning from sin, saying, Jesus, forgive me of my sin and save me. Forgive me of my sin and save me. 
I give you my heart and life. I know that only your precious blood can wash away sin. I know that you only have died on the old rugged cross. I know that you only can save me. I pray you'll work in hearts. And then for us that are saved, Lord, we're not perfect. But Lord, I thank you for you being perfect. And you are our example. And one day we will be receiving a new glorified perfect body. And Lord, help us to strive in this life to walk godly. Help us to walk seeking to not sin. Help us by your power to have victory over sin. Help us to want to be a witness for Jesus Christ. A soul winner, somebody that go, goes and loves souls. Help us to not get in arguments. Help us to go and love people for Jesus' sake. Help us, to, if they want to argue, to share the gospel seed and, and then pray over that gospel seed and to let you work the work that you seek to work in their life. I pray that you would just bless now. In this day and age in which we live, if the foundations be broken, what can the righteous do? Oh, help us to have a surrendered life. Help us to go back to building a godly family. Work in our hearts about having a godly home and godly schools and, and godly government. Help us to be concerned about our government. Help us to be concerned about voting and doing that which is right. Help us to pray and weep over our leaders. Help us to get back to the truths of the word of God. Help us to have a godly life. Help us to be concerned about our wives or our husbands and their walk with God. Help us to be concerned about our children and grandchildren. Help us to love souls. Help us to love our neighbor. Help us to get broken over their soul, being one heartbeat away from eternity without Jesus. Help us. Help us. Break our hearts. Help us to not get prideful. We're saved, and so we start thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Help us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Help us when the foundations are broken. Help us to go back to building up uh, godly foundations and building the wall strong and building the foundation strong and seeing the superstructure built for Jesus' sake. I pray that you'll bless and everything we've talked about today. Bless Pastor Dawson and this great church. Bless the faith, faithful folks, some driving many miles to be here. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being here and being in their fellowship this morning.